you very much for joining. Um, and yeah, we are recording this. So a lot of people do sort of listen back. So I know it's your bank holiday. So um, we thought it'd be a really nice way to start off the bank holiday. So yeah, the live lounge. Um, to introduce the um, our guests in the live lounge, I've in, I've invited Richard Pettinger from from Nielsen McAllister. The reason behind that is most of you probably saw Richard's blog last week that kind of put into words um, what we were all sort of thinking our first experience of the museum. So, Richard, without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you. Well, hello everybody. I hope you're all well. Welcome to the Marketing Derby Bondholders Live Lounge. Just in case we have any newcomers here today, welcome. Where have you been? Uh, my name is Richard, Richard Pettinger, and I'm an account manager at Nielsen McAllister uh, here on Green Lane. And I'm here for one specific purpose, just to introduce a couple of heroes. <laughs> Hannah Fox, Director of Projects and Programming, and Tony Butler, Executive Director for Derby Museums. And they're my heroes for two quite different but strangely connected reasons. Firstly, in my long and rather dusty career in marketing and copywriting and PR, I've had to write a great number of blogs and articles, either for myself or others. And, and often it's a very dry, complex, time-consuming and hard-thinking process. Well, last week, Hannah and Tony changed this for me forever. They helped me write my blog in exactly 12 minutes, start to finish, done and dusted. I have never found it easier. And for that, they'll always be my heroes. But the second reason and the most important reason for their heroic status is why we're all here today and why my blog was so easy to write. The Museum of Making, which opened its doors last week. Now, I'm not going to waffle on anymore because Hannah and Tony will fill you in. But I, will, I do want to just say one thing. My visit to the Museum of Making recently was the single most inspiring, informative and life-affirming demonstration of the city of Derby's determination to put itself at the very forefront of regional and dare I say it, national development, innovation and recovery. And it's an utter triumph. Please don't think twice, go visit. Hannah and Tony, you heroes, over to you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. I don't quite know how to, how to follow that. Uh, so we're, we're in this weird position of having a conversation with either end of the building. So Hannah is at one end and I'm at the other. She's in the, the, the glamorous surroundings of the River Room, which is one of our brilliant spaces for meetings. So do consider us a place to hire to, for, for all your corporate meetings. And I'm in a space called The Cocoon, which is one of our, our workshop spaces for artists and there's a, a, a sink next to me and a, and a door that goes on out onto the roof and you get some really great views of the um, electricity substation which actually is fascinating. So we're going to have a conversation with each other where, which under normal circumstances we'd kind of be sitting next to each other <laughs> talking. So I'm gonna I'm gonna really I'm gonna start because the, you know this, this project was initiated and conceived by Hannah and it, it, you know, it has her name cut right through, through, through the middle of it. And I'm gonna start by asking you a question around, you know, if we start at the beginning of this project, you were brought in to lead the transformation of the, of the silt mill. What, what do you thought you, you brought that was so valuable to what was then the museum service? Because we, we didn't exist as a charitable trust then. Um, well, first of all, I did think it was a six month project. <laughs> this is like the 10 years to the month um, of doing it. So um, I think what came in was really about thinking differently about how we approach a cultural asset and having, I know some folks on the call too, you know, know that I've been working in the creative industries for years and really passionate about creativity and design and how design thinking and human-centered design can support how you develop a brand or how you develop a place or how do you engage people in what you might do. And having done some work locally, the then um, head of museum, Stuart Gillis, had um, asked me whether I would come in and just have a, a think about what the potential could be for the, the silk mill. Um, they knew that they were going to be mothballing it. And then you were going to be creating this new charitable trust. Um, so as far as I was concerned, I was got, got this really great opportunity to 
have a, an opportunity to play with a really special place that meant a lot to many people. And the first thing to do was to open that conversation up with our communities to see what can we do here. So I think perhaps that open, open approach and using a creative mindset are probably quite two key things that I think Stuart saw I could bring into the project at that early, at that early time. And then as it progressed, and the trust was then starting to be formed, I, I was able to bring in some other elements in terms of business and um, entrepreneurial thinking and, and also development of things like brand, et cetera, that could support the, the new organization to be founded too. So yeah, that's probably the, the things I brought in the early days, definitely. Because we had a 30 conversation before the rest of you came into the call and Richard said, I, I love the summer because it's not like a museum. Um, you know, we were both a bit horrified because <laughs> it is a museum, it's just, trying to break down those preconceptions and sort of cliches of what a museum can yeah. be or, or should be, which is obviously something that you've, you, you know, you've really pushed. So the, so the human centered design element has been quite, has been really crucial to the making of the museum. Mm -hmm. And something that as, a, as an organization, we've really pushed within mm -hmm. our industry. And obviously there's lots of people on the call that are, you know, this is all sort of very, you know, meat and drink to you. you know about yeah. the, 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 the processes, but I wonder if you could just ex kind of museumify that, explain the different, explain how you adapted some of those human centred design ideas for, for a museum. Mm. I think um, human centred design is, is centering your community or people at the heart of whatever you may, you know, you, you are thinking about and creating. And it could be that there's a problem or a challenge, or it could be there's an opportunity, but whatever you're doing, you're understanding, sometimes people call them users, I'm not so keen on that because we're people, but you know, centering people at the heart of the thing that you are designing and making sure that the, the, their needs and their desires are, are, at the, are, are centered absolutely in what you might be developing. So in going into the museum of making, as it was when we only really defined the term museum of making in 2015, I think Tony it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, was like, it could be anything like this, this building and this site, it could be anything and we should be open to it being anything. Let's understand what the Derby needs, what the stakeholders in the city need, what the communities in the city need. And then through using an iterative process, which is sort of how the mindsets that you use in human centered design. So understand, so that research and development, have anyone else had, has anyone else had these kinds of challenges or opportunities in the world in different sectors? What did they do? Let's learn from what's happened before. Um, also understand what are those needs and desires of your community by talking to them and engaging with them and working with them, um, whether that be Rolls Royce or whether that be you know, a volunteer or someone who's just come in for a particular small event or a school child. Um, understanding then through that conversation and by co-producing it with them, then test a load of different ideas. So rather than going all in, which I think has been often the challenge for museums, and I think that's funding led, you know, you go with this big concept, oh yeah, we're going to make this incredible thing and it's, and it's going to do what's tell all these stories and it's really important and you're coming from a museum perspective as thinking that's why it's really, really important and it's a top down style approach. Um, and then you go out, you, you pitch it to funders, you have really glossy architectural designs, you have really glossy exhibition designs. They go, yes, fantastic. And then you get the money, it goes over budget, it goes over time, you build this thing. It takes 10 years, you open it, and then you realize that it's not relevant to those communities and to those people. And I think in a city like Derby, a small, but really well-connected city, here was an opportunity to do something with people of the city to shape up what it needs to be in the same sort of time frame and de-risk that top-down approach by, by doing it on a more grassroots level. Um, and then iterating it through meant that we could prototype, which is a really key part of human-centered design, prototyping those concepts so that when you kind of open and, and gain the investment from people, they're, they're knowing what they're investing in, you've tested it, you've worked out what works, what doesn't work, and you've got a better, you know, a lower risk offer I think and I think it's really interesting because we were reflecting last night as a team like we've only been open a week and yet it feels like we've been open way longer because it feels so natural the space feels so natural and I think that is because it's already been been running before it even opened because so many people have been involved in shaping it so I think that's very much the sort of 
flip, perhaps. That's not to say that museums, museums don't do grassroots, they do, they do some amazing community lab, level work. But when you're looking at a project of this scale, it's probably a little bit more unusual to do it the way that we have. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I, I mean, we've spoken about this previously, but this idea of a museum that's built on relationships rather than transactions. So the, the traditional model of a museum or any kind of visitor attraction would be that you, that you build it, a visitor comes in, pays their admission, has a good time, enjoys the, you know, good drink or meet in the cafe, learn something when they walk around the site and then that goes. Whereas this, this museum has been absolutely built on relationships that we, we have created with com local companies, with institutions and with individuals. And there's, there's been about 1500 individuals that have actively contributed to making this museum. And they've been involved with things like researching histories and for our storytelling, they've been involved with making you know, the recount and decount of collections as we moved out and, and back in. They've been involved with making crates and cases for display as a whole, every aspect of museum making, the public have had some kind of stake in. And that, that continues into the, what we call the operational phase now that, now that, now that we're open. So, it, I mean, it, it's not something that we haven't done before. So we've, 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 there's a couple of exhibition, a couple of displays that we created at the Museum and Art Gallery, the, our natural history display and our World Cultures Gallery, both use the same methodology. Yeah. But this up, upscales it, you know, by a, a considerable way. Do you, I mean, what was like, was there one moment in the making of the museum of making where you felt that was kind of transformational? Was, do you think, yeah, this is, this is kind of, this is going to set us on our way. And this is really kind of sim symbolized why we're going to take this approach. Yeah, I think I, I was trying to, I think there's been several, but I think the key moment um, was for Two, I'm going to cheat and say there's two key moments. Um, the first was in um, doing our initial prototype, the remake project. So coming up with as a group, as a collaboration of folks, including architects that we brought in to, to, to we really wanted to recruit folks that really understood the way we wanted to develop this project and that it wasn't going to be an architects led project. It was going to be a community led project and they are part of the team and that community. Um, and really throwing up all the ideas that we had about how, how might we create this music, you know, a museum that really does support and people to become part of making it. And how do we do that in a way that engages the head, heart and hands, which is something that we have as a values driven organization, like what, what could we do and how do we do that, that would really honor those principles. And coming up with the remake project, which was brilliant because the city council gave really generously gave a, a seed fund a capital seed fund way back in 2013 that enabled us to prototype the full concept by stripping out the ground floor of the museum as it was learning from a capital project perspective like what are the complicating factors i'd never done a, a level a scale capital project at this scale so it was really new to me and scary as hell because it's so litigious, the capital project, you know, environment and construction industry. I didn't really have all the details, but it was quite a closed book. It, I, you know, I learned a lot about, we learned a lot about the building, the amount of asbestos there was in the building, the, the structure itself. So it enabled us to test this by creating this thing called Remake, which was what if we actually made this museum and physically made it by fitting out workshops in the ground floor space? and then involved our communities in actually manufacturing whatever this prototype museum was going to be. And I think that the success of that, and I think that's when actually I got to know you as well, Tony, because you came in at that period. We'd, yeah. You sort of founded the Happy Museums project. I'd like to talk a little bit more about yeah. that with you as well. But um, we'd pitched to the Happy Museums project for this idea of what if we could measure the impact this would have clinically by working with the University of Derby and doing a case study on how you measure the impact of culture and arts physiologically with people, not just um, in anecdotally, but how do we measure blood pressure, cortisol levels, et cetera, before and after people take part in this. And so we pitched this idea to you, remake kind of came out of this, it got support, it gained traction, and we enabled us to, uh, to sort of prototype this build those relationships and solidify those relationships and test a new way of doing something that had legs to it that was really exciting and then basically formed the basis of us 
um, putting our bids into the lottery, et cetera, and saying, we're not going to tell you what these architectural designs are. We're not going to tell you what the exhibition designs are yet because we need to co-design them. But here's how we're going to do this. And we had all that evidence that helped them hold their nerve, actually, and give that funding in quite a different way. Absolutely, because I, because I think when I came into the organisation, that we it was I felt this is a really brave organisation because you had a hundred grand or so to fit out a, a ground floor space, and most most funds would be expected to you know do displays and exhibition etc. And you invested all that money in a workshop, yeah. so which was you know un, would be unexpected to most funders, um, but. Obviously, what that's doing is is laying the foundations for the space to create those relationships. And what I found really interesting was the uh, this sort of goes back to my previous role that you can build these relationships in organisations based on the exchange of non-market goods. Mm -hmm. So it'll be things like care or exchange of knowledge, rather than putting a price on 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 a skill or a price on a thing that you've made. So I, I, it's an example I always bring up is Morgan, who was a, 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 a one of our, our, our co-producers who got access to our workshop because he used to make, he made skateboards, which he'd right. sell for, you know, three or 400 pounds a throw. But in return for getting access to our workshop, he'd then go and teach groups of year five and six is coding on a, on a mm -hmm. Wednesday night. So, yeah. <clears throat> so this, the, the museum became this sort of, forum for exchange of, of non-market goods, which is, you know, at, at the time was a really interesting glimpse of what a new economy might look like. And the, the museum could be part of that was, a, you know, was, was brilliant. <laughs> and it was, it was like, it's like, how do you create places that are mutually beneficial? Yeah. Right, and so how does that then expand perspectives? And we've talked about this, Tony, how do we expand perspectives of what museum is and can be and going back to what Richard's comment before they came on the call about well it's not really doesn't it's not like a museum it's like actually we need to expand the perspectives of what those museums what museums are to to reclaim actually what their origin origins were and what what they offer in terms of really interesting civic spaces yeah. free civic spaces in our case that are owned by our city and by the communities in our city and I think that's you can only do that by being mutually beneficial. So, so back in the 19th century, most regional museums were kind of set up on a, on a, to a, the, the v &A, for example, and they were set up as places for the exchange of ideas around manufacturing and art and commerce. So they were, their, their original kind of founding principles wasn't just about kind of, you know, intellectual superiority or, or educating the masses. It was about genuine exchange of ideas and, and, and skills. And obviously the difference now is that that was all very top down. That was the, you know, the, the industrialists telling the plebs that they could, mm. they could aspire to be craftspeople. What we're doing is, 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 you know, putting that on the 21st century basis where it is about mutual, mutualism and equity and I exchange of ideas and values. So we're not yeah. kind of a million miles away from the founding principles of these sorts of institutions. And the other, the other interesting thing I think here is that we've, we've, we're, we're kind of going away from the sense of, of loss that many industrial museums, I mean, we could talk forever about changing the face of industrial museums here, but there's two things I think are really crucial. One is this sort of, the, the, it, moving away from it being a kind of mausoleum to lost industry, you know, to, 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 so back in the 70s, museums like this and museums in, in rural areas were, were, were built because industry was declining or agriculture was changing and the, the kind of that way of life was was being lost forever and so the collections and the institutions were sort of built up because because of this sense of loss as society was changing and what we've done I, th I, I hope people will see is, is, is it's not about loss it's about using that past knowledge for personal improvement and for community improvement the second thing is this real is moving away from great man history. So yeah. most industrial museums are in our museums of great, you know, great men, you know, so the, you know, you have a cigar chomping Brunels being the kind of inventor of the industrial revolution and all the, you know, and it's a bit more complicated than that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, um, so a visit here is much less about that, that sort of great man history and more about how, you know, society is built up. Looking at some of the, 
the, kind of the, the more wicked issues around empire. So the fact that yeah. there would be within the Derwent Valley, you know, you'd be using raw cotton to make cotton goods that would have been picked by enslaved people in, in America. And yeah. so empire slavery is just, just as, a, a, you know, an important factor in the growth of industry in, in Britain as, you know, this sort of unique enlightened desire to expand the boundaries of science. So I think there are two particular areas that I think we've we, we definitely um, sort of moved away from. And it, I, I'm going to say this, this museum has been built by women and it's overwhelmingly, this project has been overwhelmingly led by women <clears throat> through Hannah as the, as the project director and leader, but our head of collections, head of learning, um, our head of display, our head of develop, our director of development are all women. So Mo is on the call as well. We're, we're the kind of only two, two, two men that have been really involved at senior level with, with creating this museum. So, I, so you know, it, it also bears to be said that. Mm. I think there's also the theme around uh, for, for us in terms of the things that we're we're really interested in um, is well fundamentally how is this useful to to our city and to this place and this and this area and the communities of this area on so many different levels um, and what does that mean in terms of what what we face from a perspective of learning you know as things are ever tighter with education and the curriculum is is crunched and feels challenged by lots of different elements and um and also the environment you know thinking about envir the cha environmental challenges we have the climate crisis in a city that is rethinking how it uses um uh, its resources better and how do we become part of that conversation support some of that thinking by reflecting into the past and looking at some of the the difficult things that we have here, as you say, uh, in terms of society, but also in terms of the environment. Um, so it's it's interesting to be at this point where you see what we wanted to create was a place that was a, a, a starting point and a meeting point for people to understand who we are and why we're here and what we're about, but also to then think about well, what comes next. Like, how do we approach that next challenge that we've got? So so speaking of meeting points, I just want to ask about the Civic Hall because it is yeah. this amazing new entrance, and it, and that that's the real kind of <clears throat> statement of intent within mm -hmm. the museum. Can you just describe how that came about? Because it, again, the, it's a brilliant conversation that we were having with architects, weren't we? Yeah, it was about well, it was there's a couple of things. So there's one about the well, the people that know and remember, remember what the silk mill footprint is like, it's like an L shape, it's a factory building, so it's somewhat limited in terms of what you can, it's a grade two listed building, so we've got, there's limits to what you can do in terms of interventions in the building, but I think we've really made the most of it. Um, we, we know we're, we are a charity, we need to make the most of generating income, we need to make it the, the space work for us too, but often you see that in, in spaces where that means that then the museum gets closed, you know, an area of the museum gets closed for people, so then they're, oh, like, I can't go in that bit because they're using it for an event or the da, da, da. So, and then also that, that sense of, yeah, how do we make a statement, a wow, that feels accessible and welcoming, represents a sort of, sort of point of, right, this is the next iteration of this really important site. It's a gateway to the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's also a gateway to the city. It's a civic space that people are able to utilize for what they're interested in doing here too. And, and how do we do that? And actually the, our architects brilliantly came up with this, like, well, let's use that space that was behind previously behind the Bakewell Gates, which have now been moved back to their original position. What if we actually used the full length of that and created this triple height atrium? And because Rolls-Royce were partners, you know, really interested in being coming partners, we could then go, we've got this amazing space. We would love something that represents you as a company to hang there. And they were like, what about Trent Engine? Well, Perfect. So it's it's enabling you to kind of come in and then now we've just installed. So Lindsay, I don't know whether you will have seen this because I think you're here at the weekend. There's now a Toyota Corolla car in the front of the Civic Hall. So it it's immediately present in terms of you coming in and seeing what Derby's about in terms of it's making excellence and its prowess, but it's also a space where you can come and meet socially, have a coffee, 
And if we hire out Italian mill, which is a great space, it's not going to interrupt that general visitor coming in and getting into the museum. They're not even going to notice there's a difference there. So service is so many different things. And I think it's just, I mean, I love it. It's beautiful. And, and the council were very keen, although the first question that they asked us when we talked about building this was, who's going to clean the windows? Yeah. Well, how, how, how are you going to clean the glass? How are you going to clean the glass? <laughs> And we had to work really hard with our neighbours, like Western Power own the, um, the station next to us and they have a, a you know, right of way. So how do you build a triple height civic hall over their right, their way leave, you know, over their right of way? Well, working with them really closely and working with their directors, actually, um, they got it, they understood it. And they're like, yeah, we, we want to work on how we make yeah. this happen with you. Yeah, they, they, that, was, that was a hairy moment when we had it to... Was. <laughs> days before we put in that uh, application <laughs> wasn't it Tony? <laughs> um, I want to go back to about learning and, and, and young yeah. people because a, a really important facet of the museum is steam and yeah. this this from stem to steam and the the idea that creativity is as important to the industrial process the process of making and manufacturing as those yeah. technical skills can we talk a bit about the Institute of STEAM? Because that's yeah, yeah. So just to share that that um, has come about again. We thought we'd kind of we were early days, 2012, 13. We were like, wow. So this whole thing about STEM learning that's really interesting. But what if you put an A in there? Like, what if you put arts in there? You'd get STEAM. How cool is that? And then we realised that like the Americans were well ahead of us and they'd already invented that. But that's okay because then you can adopt and you know make it what you, you want it to be so very early we were like we wanted to talk about this interdisciplinary approach for learning um to support people to understand the world and other people um and to have the to encourage that creativity to understand you know to have inquiry-based learning that i think cultural spaces and cultural um organizations offer really powerfully you know inquiry-based learning um critical thinking, you know, critical thinking skills. So there's other skills that sit around what you might learn as fact-based elements that are really important to be able to meet the challenges that we face as a 21st century citizen. So really looking at developing the capacities necessary to, to thrive in that future, to, to be curious, to empathize, to innovate. And like we've sort of summarized that and that many others have too, it's like think, feel, do head, heart, hands. And when we're looking at it within a museum's context, we're thinking, well, from what was, so past, to what is now, to what if, and having that sort of sense of possibility. And so calling it the Institute of STEAM gives us a rigor to it. It means that we can actually give it um, an accreditation uh, level. And it also enabled um, Rolls-Royce to come on and as project partners with us in, in sponsoring and supporting the Institute of STEAM. Um, but that really now, it is the thread that runs through all of our formal learning programs with schools and educators, um, including um, CPD, continuing professional development with teachers and educators, and our lifelong learning programs too, um, because it's so important, I think, to expand that. And I think it's also changing the mindset of industry and an education from it's STEM, it's STEM, it's STEM. It's like, yeah, it is STEM, it is, but actually it's STEAM because engineering is one of the biggest in, uh, creative industries you can get. It's all about problem solving. It's all about being inquiry based and being curious about how things work. Um, and so the arts and creative thinking give you the skills to then do those things much better and to problem solve when you have, when you hit one. So yeah, that's how we sort of formalized it as the Institute of STEAM. And when you see the, the, the artistry on the Bakewell Gates, Oh yeah. You see that sort of that the, the, the skill and creativity on the, the making and the design, it, it does you know hit home. But that was yeah. you know, 300 years ago. But the, these values were absolutely embodied to making that. Yeah, and thinking about materials, right? And mm. thinking of yeah, so materiality and and Richard, you've been here, you know, we organize all of our collections in the assemblage by their material type. Um, so it's about material and skills and techniques and and people, you know, people having those um, relationships with each other to learn from each other and risk take. And I think risk taking and experimentation is something that's really key to that and key to what we do. Um, I think that's really challenging for educators at the moment in schools because there's very little time to do experimentation and risk taking. You've got such a very linear thing you need to achieve so we can create that space for that to happen. 
and that and that kind of inquiry led learning is also manifest in another major project of ours called the Midlands Maker Challenge. Yeah. Which yeah. Is, again has been sponsored to the tune of about a quarter of a million pounds by IMI, who are a big Midlands-based industrial manufacturer. Yeah. They make they make valves. They um, do. They, they make they make valves and they're like, you know, and it's really exciting technology. It's little known because they're not Toyota or they're not, you know, they've not got this name that you see on the road all the time. But they're doing the stuff like radiator valves on the things that you have at home through to big you know power stations that they're doing fluid control systems in and they wanted to do something they came to us actually and said if we if we if we worked with you and gave you an investment what would you do with it and we pitched to them this midlands maker challenge idea that came off the back of a program that we prototype called the art science prize with um, partners at harvard uh, an international partnership that we'd worked on and that was really interesting so we sort of wanted to make that much more place-based for the Midlands, part of that Midlands engine, part of that sort of development of skills um, and engage young people in it. So it's just launched. We've got 28 teams from schools across the Midlands and they've been set three challenges, one by us, one by IMI, and then one by the you know, Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and they're working through that challenge using design thinking, actually um, mindsets and processes to see what they come up with and prototype some ideas. And that lasts for the next couple of years, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's going to be, I'm, I'm so excited to see what they come up with. I'm so, I can't wait to see what comes out of the ideas of these young people because they're just amazing. And it's really interesting, having done the programme before, especially sort of around the year, the age of year nines, so sort of people know about sort of 14, they're so like, ah, you know, just about to get to the point where they're going into GCSE. So they've just got them to the point where they're just really up for anything. Um, some people can find that challenging. We're like, that's where the brain, that's where it's most exciting because if we can get them then thinking in these different ways, that will really support them in the next sort of part of their journey in terms of their learning journey too. So yeah, I can't wait to see what they come up with. Yeah. Really cool. But I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Oh, go on then. So, um, so you came in in 2014, and as I said before, um, you'd actually founded something called the Happy Museum Project, yeah. and that's how I kind of got to know you in the first instance. So two questions, like one why did you find something called the Happy Museum Project? Okay. Well, what was that about? And second, I guess, what was, what was it that attracted you? Because you're you're working in Suffolk. And I was, yeah. And family's still in Suffolk. So what attracted you to come to Little okay. Derby? So I'm a, unlike Hannah, <laughs> I'm a museum lifer. So I spent, I've, I've been working in museums for about 22, 22 years, man and boy. So my background <laughs> is very, is much more traditional. I'm a, I'm a curator by training. Social history is my my area of apparent expertise, although they don't let me very near collections anymore. Um, and prior to coming here, I was director of the Museum of East Anglian Life, which is a big open air museum in Suffolk. And I think Dawn's done some work with with, with Neil. Um, I was there for about eight years, and we kind of switched the notion of that museum as, as a, just a general visitor attraction to be, to be a social enterprise, and we were running a whole range of other social development programs geared towards long-term unemployed people, resettlement of prisoners, um, um, learning disabled adults, people using mental health services. So the whole notion of the museum was, was much more about the social value that it curated as well as being an important kind of cultural asset for the, for the county. And I dipped my toe in a, a capital project, you know, nothing on the scale of this, only 4 million as opposed to 18 million. But, um, Whilst I was director there, I did found an, a, a project called the Happy Museum Project, which was, which is a kind of challenge to museums to address, to, to look at their organisations and embody thinking that around community and environmental sustainability. So it's seeing that you know if you've got a strong, if you have strong social bonds and strong communities, you are more likely to be more considerate with the environment. So it's linking a lot of those ideas together, two sides of the same coin. And I, and I, and I suppose it was encouraging museums to think socially and, um, and eco ecologically. So if any of you have read Donut Economics, the Kate Raworth book, that a lot of the ideas within Donut Economics we tried to overlay on into Happy Museum. So Happy Museum was a project that has funded about 50 museums across the UK to develop small projects that would take those ideas, provide a space to experiment and, and work with their communities. And this is how 
Hannah and I first probably came into came into contact with each other. Um, Darby pitched for a project um, for you know a small project. I think it's about sixteen thousand pounds, and and it was such a brilliant project that we supported them. So I kind of I'd like to say I, I didn't quite bribe my way into working in 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 Derby, but no one has come back to me on that. So I so the job as as exec director came up, and I you know applied for it. And I've been here since. 2014, and I think, and more sort of, I, I suppose a more general point has been the last six, six or seven years, have, the whole organisation has grown quite dramatically. So we started mm -hmm. off with a, with a staff cohort of about sort of 35 people, and now we're nearly 100 people employed in, in, yeah. in Derby Museums. And this year will be the first year that we actually fully operate three museums in the city since 2011. So it's, it is quite a big moment this year, aside from a, us building a brand new museum. And I think at the time I came in, there wasn't, it's fair to say that it probably wasn't a huge amount of love for heritage and museums in the, in the, in the city. And in, in February, I was, February 14, I was faced with a headline from the local newspaper, from the Telegraph saying, why don't we sell the Lowry? So we had a, a Lowry picture that was worth, probably worth about a million quid in, at auction. And Neil White, who was the, the, um, the editor at the time, was on his campaign for us to start selling our collections to fund social care, which is a, a kind of perennial debate that lots of museums directors often have. And we sort of transformed from those headlines in 14 mm -hmm. to a three double page spreads in the, in the Telegraph this week, following the opening of this place and the, the Derby Ram Trail. And so what's been interesting to me is seeing how the city itself has taken the, the, the stories that we, we've got within our collections and our heritage sites and using them to support the, the message of innovation and creativity and entrepreneurialism. Yeah. So, and, it's, and, and a lot of that is embodied in the work of Joseph Wright of Derby because we've got this amazingly, amazing international renowned collection that you can see in the Museum and Art Gallery. And Wright's work embodies the human-centered design approach that Hannah has talked about. So in our Human Centered Design Handbook, which you can download for free from our website, <laughs> we've used about four, five pictures that Wright painted to kind of symbolize each step of the, of, of the design process. So on the one hand, we've got these amazing assets, but we've got the assets which can help us tell a story about our methods and our methodology and the way the city presents itself. And I think that's been a real, that's a kind of a transformation I've seen over the last four or five years as we've grown as an organization and that the city has taken its, you know, much more seriously its heritage and can see that it's a brilliant way to address some of the kind of wicked issues that we face as a community around learning, around community development, around social cohesion, but also can present quite an optimistic view of the future where innovation and, and creativity will help us um, are going to be needed to solve some of those really challenging uh, problems that we're going to face, like climate change and you know artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and living together on a crowded planet. Yeah. So I think that's the big change I've seen. And I came to Derby because it's nice and there's mountains nearby. And <laughs> my family didn't want to move and they still live in Suffolk. And I'm here during the week and live in Suffolk at the weekend. And I have the best of both worlds with sea and and, and marshes at one at the weekend and then mountains and moors um, during the week. So if you, I mean, so I think one thing I'm getting asked a lot, Tony, is, um, okay, the museum are making, it's open, it's great, like what next? And, and, uh, and so when we touch there on Joseph Wright, and I think that we're thinking, of, you know, from that perspective is, is, first of all, I think that's, I agree with you in terms of, I think, the shift that people have in the value of what museums, and also because we've made the museums more relevant to people. So, you know, I think that's been a long, a lot of work, and I'd include Mo is on the call here, you know, how do we show these museums as being places that can, are multifaceted and can be used for different, lots of different things, and they're really important historic sites, and they present a backdrop that you can see to something that you might want to do that really under, underpins this idea of innovation. Uh, which I think is really important, and Joseph Wright then being that, that sort of founding father of that thinking, or uh, well, the representation of that thinking, right, in terms of the Lunar Society and those thinkers yeah. that were working in the 18th century. So what do you think is next then? Uh, 
Um, we're going to go away and have a rest. No. Yeah. <laughs> <There's>, liar. <laughs> there are some very, there are some, uh, okay, let's have to start. So first of all, we need, we need to do something very serious with our collections. So some yeah. very bread and butter museums. We need a new store. And this is the thing, this is a really important facet of museums that people don't see. So generally, the, what you see in a museum is just the tip of the iceberg of, of collections. So within the museum's collection, there's about 300,000 objects mm -hmm. within Derby Museum's collection. Um, and one of the, the innovations that we put into place at the Museum of Making is that one particular collection of making and social history, we put more or less 100% of the items in our collections on open display, which is pretty unusual. And when you come to the assemblage at the museum, you'll see just an array of stuff, about 30,000 things in that one space. But the rest of the collections at the moment are in a, in a range of buildings that are probably not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. So there's some really kind of bread and butter museum stuff like getting a new store and putting everything in one place so that we can understand what's there and the public can access it more, mm -hmm. more readily. So that's the first thing. So it's a bit not as glamorous as building a new museum, but it's something that's really necessary. Yeah. It's a bit like fixing the roof when the sun shines. But um, yeah, our next we are, we're looking at a, um, creating a master plan for the, for the Museum and Art Gallery. Um, and I know those of you that are at the annual business event, and you'll know that John Falkin is, in, you know, is, is a big champion for a, for a Joseph Wright Museum or a, a, a more up-to-date iteration of the, the rest of the museum's collection. Again, that is something that we're, we're looking at now. Now, whether it's at the museum site or elsewhere, that's what our master planning um, is, is, is going to define. Um, but yeah, so by the end of the this financial year, we would have hopefully created a master plan for the for the rest of the um, for, for the rest of the organisation. Having you know spent the last ten years going you know, through an eighteen million pound project, we do need to reflect on how that affected us, how it worked. We've got to operate the museum of making. You know, we've only been yeah. open a week, yeah. and it's got to bed in, and all our programmes have got to bed in. And you know we want we want to be seeing people coming back again and again and again. You, be, so that's the, so we kind of think so often we sort of think in terms of, of of capital. You know, build a new museum, put a new exhibition on. Actually, what's really important for us is ensuring that people feel that they can access this stuff habitually. You know, yeah. the, the 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 museums and heritage of the city are for them, and we know that in the research that we've carried out over the years that there are. There are quite a lot of parts of the city who don't see the museums or heritage as relevant to, the, to their lives. And that's a, you know, so bridging those cultural gaps in co cultural capital are really important. Mm -hmm. Some of that can be done through, you know, uh, developing programs that are more relevant, but often that will, that will also rely on us taking stuff out to localities. The one thing we have is the, the Makery, which is our mobile museum of making. Um, which has, over the last couple of years, gone to some of the poorest communities in the, in the city, working yeah. with, with schools and, and young people who haven't grown up in a household where culture and, and heritage is something that people see for them. And the experiences that they get in the makery might be that first spark that encourages them to be, you know, the makers or the creatives or the, the engineers of the future. So we want to look at how we can exp expand that. So it's not just about work on site, it's also about work in the community yeah. and then and this and then the finally i think it, it's it's expanding our, our our online capabilities and the, the pandemic has seen lots of organizations just rush to bung as much stuff out as they can online and it's as it's of varying quality and I, one thing that has been revealed is that those organizations with a good infrastructure are creating the best online content and mm -hmm. And you know, so there's big organisations like you know, Tate, National Museum, National Gallery, etc., have the capacity and capabilities of producing really, really good online content. So throwing some more energy into that area, some more resource into that area. So there was a, a, um, a report that the Art Fund commissioned um, and that came out a couple of weeks ago. And um, that the headline was that in the future museums will be made up of thirds. So they have a third on site, a third in the community, and a third online. And I think at the moment we are probably 50, 
40, 10. Mm -hmm. And I think 50 on site, 40 in community, or maybe it's probably less than that. That's but it's overwhelmingly on site, our work, and we need to yeah. kind of um, even up the other two areas. So that's our, I think that's our, going to be our priorities going forward. I think so too. Sounds good. Let's do it. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, of okay. her, which is just what's been the most rewarding part of this project for you personally? Oh, gosh. Um, well, first of all, I'd say getting it, getting it over the line. <laughs> you know, that um, there's been moments, there's been really, really lots of challenges, not least a pandemic, but, you know, challenges with... Um, a capital project in its own right. We've flooded twice as a site. Um, we've had an amazing team to work with on that. Um, so getting it over the line and, and opening it and it feeling really right and getting such great responses from people where you're like, I, like I've said to you, I, I think this is right. I really hope people like it. <laughs> and then having really wonderful responses. I was just downstairs with a woman earlier who's lived in Derby her whole life. And she was, she just couldn't stop kind of I've just I've got to come back and I haven't seen it all and I did and I'm so proud that this is here so that's just oh it's just an amazing feeling to have that sort of sense where people are responding that way of feeling that there's a sense of ownership and pride on it and um, and I also think just working with such an amazingly wide and diverse range of folks on making it and and being able to develop some really strong and meaningful relations with people that I feel I'll you know of, of have meant that it really is something that's co-produced with our city um, and holding true to that I think has been the most one of the most rewarding elements because there's many times when there's a pressure to revert to type and you know oh no no you couldn't couldn't not have architects designs because that's what the funders will expect it's like well why not you know because actually if they trust the process and the quality of the team is good enough they're going to get something really great um, let's let's hold our nerve with that and let's help them hold their nerve too and getting those things across the line and seeing them feel really good about that too I think has been incredibly rewarding that sense of collaboration I think is ultimately the best thing what about you um oh, loads of things I think there's well, a couple of one one anecdote about community was the the guy that came in with his family and saw the Trent engine and he had his wife and kids with him and he said, it's the first time I can tell my kids what I do for a living because yeah. they can see the things that he, he, he contributes to. <clears throat> I think he worked on, the, on, on, the, on making the blades at Rolls Royce. And the, you know, the, the sort of abstract notion of, of being an engineer and, and making components that add to a bigger thing. And this was the first that he said, it's the first time I can get them to really understand you know, what, what I do. And then secondly, I think it's, it, and this is probably a, this is much more a Derby thing. Is is that being talked about as of national significance? You know, yeah. so and that's reflected in um, the public response. Trevor Rabel sent me a quick email saying, "Brilliant job, London Standard." I had that was, from my woman today. We're just like, yeah. oh, I think like, that's a compliment. Yeah, whatever. I know. I don't. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, Derby, Derby, can, but I think the notion that you can that something in the regions can be as good as something, and we've got to we've got to kind of move away from that to say that you know we've got some of the best companies in the country yeah. based here, and not just the Rolls Royce and Toyota of this world, but those people working in high ticket companies like Pentaxia that mm -hmm. are working that are making really ultra fine components for, for for vehicles. You know, we've got world leading companies in the city, and the, the museum should be somewhere that is able to give people that understanding that world leading stuff is that, that happens in, in you know in yeah. Derby. Um, and I and every time I and, and and to say that that has been always the case. So I got, I, I love that picture of the Midland Railway that's in the Railway Study Centre. It's, it's a, it says um, something like yeah Midland Railway is a picture of St Pancras in about 1910 mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's it's the it's got you know, trains coming in and out, and you lovely wrought iron roof. And everything in that gap in that picture is made in Derby from the from the steels on the roof from made at you know the Buckley Ironworks or the, the rolling stock and the locos and the carriages that would have been made in the middle roll. And the people in that picture, probably most of them are going up to Derby or coming yeah. from it. So this notion that something is is 
that is of, of national significance in our city, aside from our, the, the companies that are based here. And we have a, yeah. we have a cultural, a, you know, cultural organisations which should be viewed in the same way. Yeah, I think that's a lovely note, note to finish from you. Yeah. Back to you, Lindsay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Tony. Look, even the cat's getting involved. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. That was just brilliant. And um, loads of things sort of sprung to mind, but you were, you were kind of answering that you went along. I mean, obviously the biggest one for me is what's next, because I can't imagine you two sitting still for, for five minutes. So, um, but you did kind of answer that. And I suppose the next question, Hannah, is who is going to clean the windows? <laughs> Mo? <laughs> Mo, come on, get your shammy club. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I mean you, 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 you sort of said about already about uh, people taking it to their hearts and they absolutely haven't. Walking around with, uh, with friends and family at the weekend, uh, my husband was sort of saying, oh, I used to work there and I've done this, I've done that. And that's what you could hear all the time. And I just thought that was just brilliant. And the other thing that I found as well, and I'm sure other people will agree with me, is when they were walking around, the pure passion from the team, the volunteers, the staff, and I suppose the question to you is, how have you created that enthusiasm? Is that is that come from mm. yourselves or is that because they've been involved in the project from the beginning? Both. I mean, both. They've come, uh, there have been volunteers that have been on the project from, from you know, a decade ago that kind of came in and said, yeah, I'd love to help. And have been involved all the way through, through to people that are sort of newly arrived to us as volunteers. We just had, today we just had a volunteer induction. Uh, for people that are just really want to get involved because they've heard about it, they've seen it and, they, and they're passionate about it. Um, so that passion comes through hugely. And then from a visitor experience team, we actually recruited a whole new visitor experience team for the Museum of Making. And we went out and did it quite differently in that we did a lot of nurturing of folks and encouragement of people that might previously not think that museums are places for them to work in. And so we had a really great uh, pool of folks that uh, applied to it. And, and then uh, Janine Derbyshire, if anyone and as Janine Derbyshire is our head of it of Mr. Experience, she did the most awesome uh, training schedule that just got everyone really excited, enthusiastic, involved, the whole organisation, uh, and I think really wrapped our arms around those new folks that have started, and they're really good. They are really good. They're excited about being here. And one of them actually said at the weekend at Mill, I'm sure it'll die off at some point. It's like, I can't believe I get paid to do this. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's lovely. It's just an, an amazing team of folks here. Brilliant. Well done. Has anybody got any questions? Anybody? Thanks, Darren. Oh, oh, Mike. How are you, Mike? Hope Steak. I think you're on mute, Mike. Mike, you're on mute. No. Oh, off, off again. We're there. Oh, Mike. There you go. Right. Um... It wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. Yeah, Mike, congratulations to you both on. I mean, I've been around. We can you hear me? Yeah. On and off. Yeah. Yeah. We, go for it. We are. We're just about to issue our prospectus for um, Great Northern Classics. So we've mentioned the Museum of Making in that, uh, alongside things like Crown Derby and other attractions. So I look forward to working with you on that. Thanks. My question was actually for the future, which was many years ago. I went to um, a meeting in Manchester at a big, big Manchester law firm, and I went into their main conference room, and they had a money and a pisaro on the wall. So I said, "Will you raise her for the museum?" Mike, so, I missed your question. Can you just I, repeat I, I that? Think I, I think I got the message. Um, yeah, we do. The, we have in the past. Um, rented out pictures uh, or so allowed pictures to go out to corporate offices yeah. um, and uh, I think a, a number of them are actually in some of those very wealthy care homes that go up the A6. Um, in, the, in the past the insurance has been a, has been a, um, a factor that has put people off because these are objects of especially the, the, you know, the works by right which is the stuff that people want um, have been been the the insurance has been um, prohibitive for, for many of these firms to, to, to borrow, borrow these. It was firms. also the, th the thing is about which which ones because obviously they're civic assets and we want people to be able to see them. 
So when they go into something that's then not able to be accessed by everybody, then it's also about how you balance up that too. And so it's, it's always a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Well, it, it was a great negotiating point for me because the first thing I said was I looked at this class and said, well, those are original Monets and Pissarros on the walls. It's costing you a fortune. So it got me off to a good start with the client anyway. Excellent, thank you. Has anybody got any more questions? Oh, Katrina. Hello, um, thanks so much for sharing that. It was really, really interesting to hear. Um, and congratulations as well. It's been, I went into town today and saw the Rams and it's just wonderful to see people just stop and yeah. take photographs of them and everything. So um, looking forward to going to the museum as well. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying, Hannah, about um, the consultation um, process mm -hmm. and would just like to know a little bit more about how that worked for you in terms of how did you reach out to all of the different stakeholders groups? Did you do focus groups, surveys? No, we just actually, from the very first thing, so in May, 20, in June, sorry, June 2011, so I came in on May, in June 2011, we basically reopened the building as it was at that time uh, for an event called Shaping Vision and invited folks over a weekend to come in and tell us what, what was going on with them, what's their, what are their interests, what are their passions about this place, why was it important to them, what are the challenges they face, and we had 800 people come in that weekend and that sort of shaped the way for us in terms of how you co-produce that concept. So beyond consultation, how does it become something that you do together? Because people came in and shared their ideas and then we went, those are amazing. And they sort of started to form themes, um, at, but we obviously, it was me and, uh, and friends that I got volunteers that started the ambassadors in the city and people that were interested in helping out. We've got a limit of resource and a limit of skills and knowledge. Would you come and help do some of these ideas with us? And they did. So over that sort of period since then, that's what we've been doing is co-producing this concept by prototyping our ideas together, trying out different things, um, working on programs, collaborating on uh, events, um, and then trial and test, trial and test of that. And so anyone can come from a point of view of being a a volunteer who wants to formally volunteer with us as an organization now um, through to it might be an organized a, a business or a stakeholder that is interested in doing a, a, a development of a program but it has to be for us in the museum of making is how is this help us make the museum of making how is this informing the idea how is this helping shape up that idea how is it useful to this project okay yeah it is let's do it and so and, and the numbers i guess formally if you're looking at individuals, we've, as Tony mentioned, we've had over a thousand people as regular volunteers and putting onto it from uns, classed as unskilled, which is, I think, just not a non thing, but that's how funders class it. I mean, how can you be unskilled? You're not, you bring something um, through to professional. And there's a, a monetary value to that that then has actually contributed over three quarters of a million pounds to the project in um, in kind funding. That's great. And then everyone feels invested in it, don't exactly. they? Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap it up a little bit now because I know that Tony. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Tony and Hannah. I know Tony, you need to be uh, be in next meeting, um, so we'll wrap it up. But I will put you into breakout rooms. But just to just to remind you that we are going to be at the Museum of Making for our first in person event on next Thursday, which we're really excited about. Um, Sharon, Sharon's very excited. I'm not sure if Sharon's excited about the, the, the event or the bacon sandwich. I'm not sure. <laughs> so um, if you haven't booked tickets, please do so. And um, I also met up with Christine on Wednesday. So I did get to see the Toyota car on Wednesday. Oh, you did? Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she said, if you looked up, I was just like, oh my goodness, where's, where's that come from? Um, so met up with Christine as well. So we were talking about potentially holding the next Christmas bond holder Christmas party there. So that might be in the pipeline as well. So um, again, thank you, Tony and Hannah for your time. I know you're incredibly busy, um, but yeah, I'll open the breakout rooms. Feel free to stop on. So thanks folks. Thanks. Thank you very much.